This is Force for Hire. A deep dive into private military contracting and how it's transforming the battlefield. I'm Michelle Harvin. And I'm Desmond Ferris. On January 15th, 2016, Russell Frost, Amr Muhammad, and Wael El Madawi were surrounded by men with heavy weaponry and kidnapped. They were detained and tortured for 31 days. They were the first U.S. citizens kidnapped in Iraq since 2011. The three were working on a subcontract for General Dynamics in Baghdad, where they were helping train Iraqi forces. Muhammad and El Madawi are cousins, and both served in the U.S. Army. Frost didn't have a military background, but he had been working as a contractor for nine years prior. The jobs increasingly got more dangerous as troops and support staff were drawn down. This contract was the first time he was armed and the first time he wasn't living on a U.S. base. On January 15th, the three of them went to meet an interpreter who they later learned had set them up. I talked with Amr, who described what had happened that day. So you have people sitting with AK-47s on the top of the buildings and the area. So you have one entrance, one exit. And it was blocked by uh, a truck with a dishka was a 50 cal on it. And from the look, at least 42 guys was AK-47 or whatever, and you've got three guys, one of them is civilian, who has never been in combat, which Russell and Well and I, and we have Walter with 10 rounds in it. So I ended up handing my gun after 15 minute argument. It's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. I never ever handed a weapon down to anybody. The next phase, they took us in the van to their leader compound. We entered the leader compound, had government vehicles, black armored SUVs, crates of weapons. They start telling us, take everything off, your jewelry, your, your shoes. And they just kept us in our clothes, but they searched our clothes, you know? And they took our shoes and everything and we became barefoot. And then they put like rags on our eyes and they did it with scotch tape. And then handcuffed our hands behind our back. They couldn't do that because Russell's so big. They did like two flex cuffs together to be able to put his arms behind his back. They put each one of us in different areas. They put us in, in what they call uh, uh, the query. They call the, 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 the hole that they put you in is a query. It is like a concrete floor with two concrete walls with a concrete wall on top of your head. Maybe four, four feet tall. So you cannot actually stand straight. And the length also four, four, four feet by five feet. So you cannot lay down, you have to be in a fetal position if you lay down. And if you stand, your head will going to be hitting. So you're going to be standing like this all the time. Yeah, a bunch over. So you have no ability to fight. The fact that I, I knew that we're taken by Sarai Salam, which is the, the it morphed out of Jesh al special group. I knew right there and then that I am in a safer hand than being in the hand of Al Mohandis, who is the head of a complete different militia that will ask for ransom and then kill you because that's the way they do it. But the fact of the matter, it relieved me because I knew I was not going to get killed anytime soon. I'll be used as a bargaining chip. Russell surprised me with how calm he was, how quiet he was. They ended up falling in love with Russell and respecting him. And like they were fond of him. How like that big gentle giant, so polite, so quiet, doesn't request anything, doesn't ask them for anything. If they give him, he would take it. If he doesn't, if they don't give him, he would be hungry. He wouldn't even ask for food. They would come as like, tell Russell what he would like to eat tonight. We're going to bring him kebab. And we'll start laughing about it. They thought that in their head, he is the American because they're asking, He's the CIA because he was so quiet, he was so polite. He would answer, yeah, like he asked a question, he would answer the question with the least amount of words. He was so professional. I swear to God, like 
I couldn't, I was like doubting him that he's truly, really an SF guy or, or, or a special force for the way he handled himself. Oh my God. He handled himself with grace, with honor, with dignity, and a true American. Can you tell me what was the hardest day? Always the first day because you are in disbelief. Is this fucking happening to me? After 12 or 13 missions, this happened to me? I always thought I might get killed one day, but being taken hostage, that never crossed my mind. That's the hardest day, the first day, because you are in the unknown. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what they're going to do to you. After the, 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 the third day, you start using what you have been trained for. After this, the, the, the first week, you start thinking like, okay, this is getting a routine now. I can fucking cope with that shit. I can fucking take that shit all day long. Six days before our release, he came and told me, you're getting released, guys. And he told me, don't tell YL or Russell. You guys getting released in, in five days. Five, six days, you get, you're going home. Please don't, I, I, take, I try to grab his hand and kiss it. So he take my hand and kiss my hand and says, I am so sorry for everything that happened to you. And then he kissed my head. It's like, you know what? I wish if I can. And they start crying. I wish if you, I can take the blindfold of your, of your face. You're a good man and give me a hug or whatever. I said, guys, you're going to be going home. I stayed two days not saying anything to the guys, but I couldn't take it anymore. So I went in the middle of the night. I, I whispered in Russell's ears. I told them, we're going home in three or four days. And I told well, I told them, don't tell anything to Abu Marina. And we kept it to ourselves until he came and announced it like two days prior and said, guys, you're going home. But at that time, we were relaxed, we were laughing, joking, because we're knowing we're going home. How did it feel when those embassy guys actually came and got you? It was so real. It was amazing. It was amazing, you know, to see the familiar faces, uh, service member like you, you know, coming and taking you. They give me the American flag. They give Russell the American flag. But truly what surprised me, Russell's reaction of being a civilian who has never been in combat, he operated with so much dignity as a civilian contractor and with professionalism than I would have ever imagined. I was so worried about him. Like a week into it, I was like, oh my God, I have to learn from this fucking guy. There is nothing I would have never done for him. When his wife called me, I was driving back from Las Vegas. I answered to Stammy and she was crying and in shock. Like, what's going on? She said, Amr Russell passed away. I told them, joke with me. Don't fuck with me. Please don't lie. You're lying to me. It's that Amr, please, I'm, I'm not joking. Jo he passed away just now. He died. Then I put the car in bark and I was just, uh, for 15 minutes, the whole scenario of the kidnapping and the torture and everything, just all of that got into me at that moment when I heard that Russell died. I broke down. There's two times that happened to me in my whole entire life when my mother passed away and when I heard that Russell died. The voice on the other line that day was Tammy Frost, Russell's wife. I sat down with Tammy and she told me that when Russell started out as a civilian contractor, this was completely new territory for the family. Quite honestly, I'd never heard of military contracting uh, for the civilian. Um, I thought it was strictly either retired military or um, subcontracting of military. Uh, when Russ first told me that he was looking into it, I said, absolutely not. Um, as we did further investigation, he said he would be in a safe place. It wasn't going to be where I thought it was going to be. And I wanted him to follow his dream. He wanted to provide for the family. And so I supported my husband. The worry, <laughs> you can't even measure. Um, I knew at that time we were still within a war. Um, there was absolutely too much conflict for me to be comfortable with. 
Uh, he was, his initial contract was in Kuwait. Uh, it wasn't in the military zone. However, he provided that support to them. Uh, he would be located on a military base at that time. And uh, so I felt a little bit more comfortable knowing that he would be protected by our forces there. Fast forwarding to his last contract where he wasn't on a military base, quite apprehensive at that contract. I stayed in regular contact with my husband. I spoke to him on the daily. Um, as I was getting ready for work, each morning he would call. He would say, have a good day. We would discuss his day because we were on opposite sides of the clock. Um, I had texted him when I had not heard from him. Uh, the, following, he, the last time I heard from him was Thursday. He had mentioned that he may be going on a trip to Egypt, but that he would let me know. Friday came around and I did not hear anything from my husband. And so I started texting, hey, did you get there okay? Are you, are you in Egypt? I had no response. Friday evening was when he was kidnapped. Saturday passed again, I'm texting, I'm emailing. Um, I'm trying to ping his phone, uh, trying to locate him. There was no response. Sunday came, I said, listen, honey, I'm getting a little worried. I need to know that you're okay because it was totally out of character for him not to be letting me know that he had arrived somewhere okay or that he was checking on us here at home. Sunday came, still hadn't heard from my husband. Not shortly after I had texted, I got a call from the owner of the company. Excuse me. He said, Mrs. Frost, this is Mr. Parkman. I hate to meet you like this, but your husband has gone missing. I said, what do you mean my husband went missing? He said, ma'am, your husband didn't report back to base. I said, where is my husband? He said he had gone into the city of Baghdad and that he did not return to base. He then asked if there was anyone he could get for me to be with me, a friend, a best friend. I said, sir, my best friend's missing in Baghdad. Just bring him home. There was other calls that followed. FBI was called to my home. They sent out a team to help us deal with the crisis. There was conversation back and forth between the company and then all conversation ceased. I lived 31 days knowing that my husband was there somewhere. And they needed to bring him home. Amanda is the Frost's oldest daughter. They both described what it was like dealing with the government agencies and the company during this time. They would answer your questions with questions. It was classified. Yeah, it was all classified. We don't know that right now, which didn't expect them to tell us exactly where he was. Um, but it was just you fly the state department to someone's home, you know, you've got all these suits that are sitting in your living room and not, I mean, for them to travel so far and not one of them have a real answer um, for any of your questions, it, it got a bit frustrating. And it really, it really, it didn't put us at ease at all. There was just no good communication anywhere. Truly once he was, once he was kidnapped, the fusion cell is who kept us in the loop, other than family members of the other two captives. The fusion cell is a cell, is a group of individuals that are under the FBI umbrella. They are expedited to the homes to help with hostage situations. They provide whatever is necessary for you to cope with the crisis. Um, in essence, it's a hostage situation. They are there to monitor telephone conversation 
or anything else that we might need in order to bring your loved one home safely. Russ was not from a military background, nor were we. Uh, I was contacted by YL's brother, Tamar. And Tamar um, was able to uh, communicate with some individuals that had more information about what was happening over there as far as communications and chatter. After that first couple of days, there wasn't any contact with the company. They had washed their hands and they were bound legally. Um, so uh, the conversations with them would be nothing more other than um, having some kind of insurance and making sure that the family was covered with health insurance so that um, there wouldn't be any break in that. However, I, I feel personally, I feel like they had already given up hope that my husband wasn't coming home, nor were the other two captives. Honestly, I had all the faith in the world that my husband would be home. I felt in my heart that he was still alive. He, there would have been some way that he would have got the message to me if something was, was dire. Um, obviously it was dire. However, I did feel in my heart, I had the faith that my husband was still alive. My kids, they are my rock. Uh, we relied heavily on one another while he was gone. And we just had to hold out hope that he would be home to us. When we come back, the Frost family finally gets some good news. Stay informed on all the news that matters most to the military community with a subscription to Stars and Stripes Digital Access. As a subscriber, you'll enjoy unlimited access to the Stripes.com website and our Stars and Stripes mobile apps, updated 24-7 by reporters stationed at military bases around the globe. Subscribe today and enter the promo code PODCAST when signing up for a yearly subscription and receive 50% off your first year. Get exclusive access to special features, interactive articles, award-winning photography, and more. Visit stripes.com slash digital and enter the promo code podcast to subscribe today. I work in the um, school district and I had arrived at work. I had a calendar on my desk where I had days that I pulled off of a calendar so that I'd know how many days had passed. As I was reaching to pull day 32, I received a phone call and it was an agent who was on her way to work. She said, Tammy, we have them. They're on the way to the embassy. I'll let you know more when I know more. But she said she wanted to let me know as soon as she found out so um, I left work, of course. I went home. I waited for the phone call just to know that he was okay. I got the phone call probably just a couple hours later. He was on his way to Landstall to be checked out medically. But at least I got to hear his voice. And he says, I'm okay, hon. He says, I'm coming home. I love you. I can't talk anymore right now, but I'll talk to you more in a bit. Those words were the most precious words ever. I talked to him more later after, it was actually a couple days later after he had arrived in Landstuhl and they had gone through debriefing. You hang on to every word, every word. I didn't know the half of it until after he had gotten home. But I knew I was getting him home. Happiest day of my life. I read that uh, he fell asleep in um, an airport. <laughs> <laughs> he was scheduled to arrive in... Um, day prior before he actually got here, he uh, 
had an FBI escort because, of course, he had no identification, no money, uh, nothing on him. It had all been stripped from him. Uh, so I am at the airport expecting him in from Chicago, um, sitting there patiently waiting, and I get a phone call. <laughs> Honey, I'm sorry. I fell asleep in the lounge. I'll be on tomorrow, but could you do me a favor? Can you fax your credit card number to the hotel so I'll have some place to sleep tonight? <laughs> so I did so. Uh, he did arrive safely the next day, but he was exhausted. And the agent that was escorting him thought that he would be okay from there since he didn't have to go through any other checkpoints. So um, he made it home just a day later. <laughs> The FBI agent here uh, in Wichita, he was able to uh, make arrangements so that we can meet Russ on the tarmac. Uh, so we were able to meet him as he came off the skywalk there at the aircraft. And it was a sight to behold. Once a large man and full of life, he was much slighter. And quite honestly, he had a hollow look in his eye. Uh, as soon as he came off, though, uh, it was hugs. There was wincing on his part because he was still sore from the treatment that he had received. Uh, so I scooted him down the skywalk and into the vehicle where our children awaited for us. And uh, then we were off to home. He had to make mention to the girls that he, they had to be careful with him. We didn't, during the 31-day period, uh, know of any injuries. It wasn't until after uh, they had arrived in Landstall and I was able to speak to Russ at length that he had made mention of any injury. It wasn't until he got home that I seen the extent of the injuries. We went from having a dad that he was the one that would put band-aids on the boo-boos and, you know, teach us to walk and teach us to do things. And we kind of jumped into, all of my sisters really uh, jumped into caretaker mode because be with him during the day because we didn't want to leave him alone. Um but a lot of that time was spent taking him to doctor's appointments, um, just talking. He he talked a lot. <laughs> uh, and not just about what happened. I mean, we tried to avoid that because we could tell he would visibly and, and physically get upset, you know. Um, so we would talk about everything. And I think he was just so happy to be able to have those conversations and to go to the, you know, football games to watch his daughter cheer, you know, go participate in something that was going on at my, at my sister's college, you know, just be around his grandson. He was just so happy to be able to do those things. It was, it was like he, he was trying really hard not to take those things for granted and he was catching up and it, it was, it was nice to be able to care for him. And it was nice that he would allow us to, in, in some capacity to take care of him. Um, I mean, those are, going to be the, the lasting memories that we have of him. Um, but yeah, he, he just required a lot of attention. He, he needed the company and, and the, the security of having his family with him. I could take you to an instance. It was a Thanksgiving. It was a week almost to the day of his passing and he was carving the Turkey and he couldn't even stand. He had to kneel on the ground because his back hurt so bad. And a lot of his injuries weren't something that you see. They were invisible injuries. My dad had issues with sleep. He had issues with his muscles. Um, his PTSD was horrific. Um, so it was the injuries that you couldn't see that were really the most debilitating. His kidneys... Um, he had, because of the dehydration, he had horrible kidney stones. 
And that led to a severe infection in his kidneys, which is what was the catalyst for everything else. I was probably one of the most patriotic persons you'd ever meet. Um, however, I, if I were to be honest, I question some of the government agencies and DBA is run by the government, which is the Defense Base Act uh, Longshoreman Workman's Comp. DBA is filed and therefore the company has nothing more to do with it. Uh, DBA then takes over and they work as a workman's comp uh, for workman's injury. And they tend to drag their toes in the deepest sand that could possibly find. Those issues began at day one. We were paying for everything out of pocket uh, because DBA refused to pay anything until they reviewed the claim. Um so therefore, some of the medical necessities were foregone because there was no money left. Uh, they weren't receiving a check uh, for disability to begin with. Um, and then those checks slowly started coming in. However, there was medical attention that he needed prior to those. And uh, being that his income was what we relied on, um, it was no longer there to take care of the medical. So we were forced to take out loans to pay for medical bills. And then Russ passed because he was still waiting a surgery that he needed. And they refused to pay. What was the idea for Contractor Appreciation Day? Uh, it actually started when my dad was kidnapped. Um, <clears throat> it was sort of the catalyst because we would see some of the comments that would pop up on social media. And uh, it was very ignorant, to say the least. Um, they they view contractors, or at least what it seemed like the general population of you know social media, um, thinks that these guys are hired guns, that, that all they do is, you know, they wear guns and they you know, protect people, whatever. And, you know, we would get a lot of the, they knew what they were getting into. Yes and no. Um, no one goes into a job expecting to be kidnapped. Just like you don't go into the military expecting to be sent overseas into a war. I mean, it, it was just very hateful, very um, ill-informed. Um, and that that's what started it. And then when my dad got home, and we were we were seeing how he was being treated um, through DBA and the insurance company. Um, we we just knew something had to change, and it wasn't unfortunately it wasn't until he passed that we were we had that fuel to do something. And it it starts with an appreciation day, but the end game is to get some legislation changed. Um, have the law show appreciation. And that that's the big part, because if we're going to utilize these men and women um, overseas and in war zones, then we need to treat them as such. We need to offer them, you know, the insurance. We need to make it to where certain things need to happen for protection for them as well. Um, so when I approached our state uh, representative, uh, Joe Seiwert, um, we kind of got the ball rolling here in the state of Kansas. So we were able to get my dad recognized on the Kansas legislative floor. Um, from there, we got a hold of Senator Moran and a uh, defense fellow, Kelly McManus. And I, I kind of pitched it out there, thought it was a shot in the dark, um, just basically said what had happened and what we're trying to do. And I get a phone call. She said, you know, I'm very interested in your initiative. I'm going to, you know, talk to Senator Moran and we're going to see about getting this ball rolling. And, and it's been a slow process. Um, but we we've, we've stayed in contact and she's been very helpful and very kind and you can tell she, she really cares. And, um, so I, I'm hoping that that leads to getting some appreciation for these guys to say, Hey, we know you exist. 
we appreciate the job that you do. Without you, we wouldn't be as great. I think there's been such a a, a stigma of, of contractors. They're they're hidden. Um, and that's what's strange to me is that I mean, before my dad had done this, we had no idea that this was even a, a job you could do. It's just a weird it's just a weird dichotomy, I guess, that we will utilize them up to, you know, 50% of our actual force that's overseas, but we're not going to let other people know that. Why? You should be proud of that. You should be proud that you have these civilian patriots, if you will, that are willing to risk their lives in order to help their military. And a lot of these guys are ex-military, but then there's other guys that maybe later on in life, wanted to show their appreciation and wanted to be involved. And that's why they do what they do. That was kind of my dad's thing. My dad was always a patriotic person. He was always a proud American. He just missed the boat to do the military side of it. And then he looked at this as a second chance and that's why he took it. And he was very proud of it. Absolutely. Very, very proud of his job. And he was anxious to get back to work. So these guys deserve like that recognition. It's just recognizing that they exist. And I've had so many contractors approach me on through Twitter and through Facebook saying, this is amazing. You know, it's about time we got, you know, some kind of recognition. And the emails just flooded in. You know, I'm going through the same thing your dad went through, or I've been a contractor for 15, 20 plus years. And I agree with you. We should be, you know, more appreciated or at least recognized. So it's there. The interest is there. It's a strong arm that's trying to push those voices down a little bit, I think. And we don't understand why, but we're pushing back. And I think with the Private Patriots Foundation, our voice is getting a little bit louder and our reach is getting a little bit wider. And that's where we're at right now. And that's where we're going to continue to push forward from. I just think that the public needs to know that these are not mercenaries. These are husbands, fathers. They're aircraft workers. They're painters. They're mechanics. These are not mercenaries. They are not there to harm anyone. They're there to protect our military and to help out each and every one of them in any way possible that they can. We need to blow the cloud away so that that dark cloud isn't hanging over their heads any longer. And they need to be given the acknowledgement that they are doing a job as well as the military. They just didn't sign up for it like the military. August 13th, Russell Frost's birthday is recognized in Kansas as Contractor Appreciation Day. The Frost family, along with the Private Patriots Foundation, are working toward making the day nationally recognized. Thank you to Amr Muhammad for talking with us about his experience, and thanks to Tammy and Amanda Frost for sharing their story. Also, a special thanks to John Austin Diamond, who runs the Private Patriots Foundation. You can learn more about the push for Contractor Appreciation Day and their organization at privatepatriot.org. In the next episode, We'll be moving from land to sea, where we'll try to answer the question, what makes maritime security so challenging? So if it's a Panamanian flagship or a Marshall Island flagship or a Liberian flagship, you are then under the effectively the jurisdiction of the country of the flag. And if the country that you're working to, so let's say, for instance, the United Arab Emirates, they will not allow weapons to be in their territorial waters, which is why when many ships are going to the Middle East, they have to have the floating armory so that men can be disembarked and embarked in international waters. Don't forget to subscribe. And while you're there, leave us a review. You can also let us know your thoughts at podcast at stripes.com. Also, follow us on Twitter for updates at Stars and Stripes. Force for Hire's supervising editors are Bob Reed and Terry Leonard. Digital team lead and editor is Michael Darnell. Thanks for listening. This, this is, is Force, Force for, for Hire. hire.